Hey teens! Hi guys! How's it going? And anybody else that's watching this video, how's it going? And hopefully Lenore, because I don't think I'm going to mention you this week, so... But I should just mention you now, so... Hi Lenore! <laughs> so, anyway, welcome everybody to another week of video. Praise and worship. Yep. But that's okay, we have a lesson, it's really good. We are going to go into, as we've said before, we're going into the New Testament, through our, which we did the 90 day challenge, and we're actually into 1 John. And it's like 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, but all we're going to be covering today is 1 John, because there's, there's a, a lot, lot in there. A lot of good stuff in here. So uh, obviously the first thing we're going to do is prayer. So everyone, bow your heads. Thank you, Lord, so much for this day. Thank you for the breath of life that you give us. Thank you for your words so that we can just have, you know, more knowledge, more understanding, more wisdom that you just give us in your word. It's just so full of just greatness, and it's from you, Lord. You breathe it into us. So, Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for these teens and anyone else who is watching. Please bless them. Watch over them. Please be with us as we go through this, this trying time and this new norm and uh, be with us as we transition to to the next step we know that you're with us Lord your plan is is perfect and it's your will and it's not of our own so Lord please bless us may we speak nothing but you in your name we pray and we just thank you Lord for everything amen amen all right so like I said we're going into the first book of John so first John <laughs> And I wanted to read this, so I'm going to read a little bit from my Bible. And I want to give a shout out to Pastor Charlie. Um, I don't, obviously, Pastor, you're watching because you edit. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for this Bible. This Bible uh, he gave to me it has so much in it, and it's a New King James Version. And I absolutely love it. There's so much into it. And I actually am going to read quite a bit. Um, it has the verses, but also has a lot of other meat in it, basically. And so I'm going to start with that. And also, Pastor Charlie, yes. we're using your notes from your your lesson on First John, guys. This yeah. is a fantastic resource. You can print these out. These are question. These are uh, bullet points that he'll go over mm -hmm. in his video. You can follow right along, and it's great information. So let's start. The book of First John. God is light. God is love, and God is life. John is enjoying a delightful fellowship with that God of light, love, and life. And he desperately desires that his spiritual children enjoy the same fellowship. God is light. Therefore, to engage in fellowship with him, we must walk in light and not in darkness. As we walk in the light, we will regularly confess our sins, allowing the blood of Christ to continually cleanse us. Nice. Christ will act as our defense attorney before the Father. Proof of our walk in the light will, will be keeping the commandments of God and replacing any hatred we have towards our brother with love. Two major roadblocks to hinder this walk will be falling in love with the world and falling for alluring lies of false teachers. God is love. Since we are his children, we must walk in love. In fact, John says that if we do not love, we do not know God. Additionally, our love needs to be practical. Love is more than just words. It is actions. I've told you guys that so many times. Love is giving, not getting. Biblical love is unconditional in its nature. It is an in spite of love. Like so many times when Jesus was saying, you know, when someone, when someone hits you, you know, basically when someone slaps you, you turn the other cheek. You're always looking like, you know what, even though you did this to me, even though you gossiped about me, even though this happened, I'm going to look at you in love in spite of what was done. That's what that means, in spite of. Christ's love fulfilled those qualities, and when that brand of love characterizes us, we will be free of self-condemnation and experience confidence before God. God is life. Those who fellowship with him must possess his quality of life. Spiritual life begins with spiritual birth, being born again. Spiritual birth occurs through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ infuses us with God's life, eternal life. Therefore, one who walks in fellowship with God will walk in light, love, and life. So I wanted to start off with that because I thought that was very, very powerful. It's a great And summation. the great thing is... In chapter one, so there's five chapters. We're going to go over all five chapters today. 
So everybody, then, grab your Bible. Yes, please. Turn to First John. It's towards the back. We're almost to the end. Mm -hmm. So turn to First John and follow along, please. So basically, there's two subtitles. It says walking in light and confession of sin. So Chuck's going to go with first of walking in light. So let's go to First John. I'm going to start with chapter uh, chapter one, verse five. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son purifies us from all sin. If we cl claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. We're all sinners, guys. Mm -hmm. So like I said, uh, the Bible that Pastor gave me, it has a lot of other stuff in it. And it said, we're talking here about how we confess our sins. And then down here on, in my Bible, it says confession. One of the most remarkable chapters in the Old Testament is Psalm 51. So I want mm -hmm. everybody to go to Psalm 51. It's back a bit. Okay. This psalm contains the actual words of confession uttered by King David after his great sins of adultery and murder. So we're going to go there right now. Psalm 51. And this is what it says. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before you. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight. That you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. And one of the things that it says here is it says this prayer can serve, can serve as a pattern to the Christian when he is guilty of sin in his life today. Mm -hmm. That's one of the great things about the Bible is that even though it was written so long ago and they had eyewitnesses, you know, John and James and all the, they're still for us today. Mm -hmm. It still works for us yes, today. It it's the pathway for us today. So here's the great thing about that. It does four things. The first thing that that prayer does is, one, it says David begins his prayer by freely admitting his sin. Mm -hmm. See, that's what we need to do. We need to Step admit one. our sin. Yes. yes. Okay? This honesty is vital in our confession. God will graciously forgive all of our sins, but not on account of our excuses. So it's not an excuse. He's confessing. He's not making it, well, they made me do it. Well, you know, I, I, you know, I was with the crowd and... You know, they were doing it, so I had to do it. No, he brought Following it to along, them, yeah. and he like he was he confessed it to right up front to him. It says, two, when he then displays real sorrow over his sin. Okay? That's something that we need to have. If we're just, oh, you know what, Lord, my bad. You know, yeah, I sinned, you know. And then you just keep going back to it and everything. You're not being very sorrowful over it. You're not bringing it to him with a sorrowful heart. Like, you know... And with a broken, like, Lord, please, like, I admit to it. Look what I did. And mm -hmm. it up, it, it's not secret. It's up front. When you're trying to live a secret life or secret sins and all that kind of stuff, it, it's, it's you're living in the darkness. This is what Amen. we're just talking about. Three, he asks God's forgiveness. So not only is he now, he said he brought it to basically to God's attention. God knows anyway, but he brought it to God's attention. And then he asked God because God is the father. He is the Abba. He's the all. Of, so he knows that, you know, Lord, please forgive me. He brings it to him. And then the last, he believes that God has heard him and will restore him. And that's one of the things that we need to, we need to do. Like David, we must admit our sin, regret the actions of our sin, Plead the blood of Christ and believe that God has indeed done what he promised. Namely, to cleanse us from sin and restore us to fellowship and service. Amen. So that's very, that's very, very important. 
So now we're going to be on our way to chapter two. So everybody, of course, it's right next door, chapter two. And the great thing, again, is that in chapter two, it says there's three powerful enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So it says in my Bible here, it says three powerful enemies are constantly trying to defeat the Christian's testimony and spiritual success. The world, the flesh, the devil. The key to conquering the world is the love of the Father. Victory over the flesh is through the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and power over mm -hmm. the devil is in the Son of God, who came to destroy the works of the devil. And that's in 1 John 3. The world, in actual, the, the Greek word is cosmos, and the root meaning of cosmos is order or arrangement. Hence, beauty, cosmetics, cosmos flower, the main meaning of cosmos is an organized system that is under the devil's control and leaves out God and Christ. Cosmos is a major New Testament word with over half of its occurrences in John's Gospel, where it is one of the evangelist's key terms. The great thing is, is that cosmos does, doesn't always have a negative connotation. It's not always negative, because the great thing is, one of the biggest and most famous verses in the bible is john three sixteen, and it says obviously everyone knows for god so loved the world cosmos meaning look what he did he loved the world so much that he gave his own son. everybody <laughs> the flesh the literal meaning of flesh is found in expressions like flesh and blood and flesh and bone christianity doesn't teach that the human body is evil but that it can be used for evil. So understand that. When you're looking at yourself and you're thinking, I'm no good, I'm not worthy, I have nothing to offer, I'm a terrible person, I'm not pretty, I'm not smart, I'm not whatever, you know, your, your body is not evil. It can be used for evil. You have a choice, a choice to decide which way you want to use it for. As a destructive influence, the flesh can be our our most biggest enemy because it is inside the believer and ever present in its depraved cravings. Even sincere and devout Christians, including the Apostle Paul, can have terrific struggles with the flesh. We all have that. Mm -hmm. We all have the, the struggles. One <laughs> should not think that he or she is not a true believer because of such temptations. Unfortunately, in a certain sense, as long as we live in the body, we will have to contend with the flesh. Okay, the secret to that over the flesh is to be led by the Holy Spirit, to walk, to live your life in the Spirit. Mm -hmm. you, if you do that, then you will be able to withstand the lust of the flesh and everything that comes with it. And that even, that talks about it all over, like in Galatians, talks about that all over in the Bible. We can't do it on our own. Our flesh is weak, but with God is where we get our strength and you know, he's our power source, like I've said so much. And one of the things that you notice, I, I'm sure you guys have noticed, since we've been doing the New Testament, it's a lot of, it seems like a lot of repeat. And in, in fact, it is. It talks a lot about false teachings, talks a lot about your faith, talks a lot about all the different things. The great thing is, is when it's broken down, you have, because you have different accounts from different people. Paul, Peter, John, James, like different witnesses. And so they're all giving their own accounts. And in some chapters, one will focus more on love um, as to where others it will focus more on something else. Well, look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, mm -hmm. and John, because they're, mainly they're writing about the Last Supper, but each has their own version of it. So they're all different in some ways, but they repeat each other, yes. If you guys were to see an accident, and I think I told you about an accident that I saw a while back. I was at Panera and stuff. Um, I had witnessed an accident. Some lady backed into this guy. Um, he, he's okay, but they separated us to get our account of it because this way, number one, we couldn't collaborate, and number two, we had our own version of it. That's kind of how the, the Bible is. It's their own version, Matthew's own version, Mark's own version. It's their own version of the accounts, but what I, it's true. I saw the accident. It was true. So I might have had a little bit of a different version than the guy did, mm -hmm. but I still gave an account of what I saw. This is the same thing. The last thing it talks about is the devil. 
And it says here, the devil is a personal enemy who is opposed to God, his people, and his plans. Now it says an ancient secular usage of this word is slanderer. So a lot of times when we're talking about, you know, you're a slanderer, you slandered someone's name, you gossiped about somebody or something, you're slandering. You're basically doing the devil's the work. Devil. <laughs> That's exactly what you're doing. You're not building that person up. You're actually bringing them down. And that's one of the things that says that it, 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 it refers to Satan as our adversary. He is not for us. He is against us. And so those are the three things that it talks about that we're dealing with in chapter 2. The biggest enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. So I want to go to pastor's notes. And it says there's two potential problems. Truth. Sin is universal. Wrong conclusion. Everybody does it. It's no big deal. We have the grace of God. So what? Truth. Sin is forgiven. That is true. Wrong conclusion. Ah, just confess it to God. Shall we continue to sin then? Do the same sin over and over? It's no big deal. All you got to do is just bring it to God. It's all fine. So there's where sometimes you have a truth, but people will like spin it and turn sure. it into kind of what works for them. And that's mm -hmm. not how it is. And Pastor, in his notes, it says, Just because sin is universal and because it is forgiven, it does not give us a license to sin. God's will that you may not sin. Instead of being known for sinning, we should be known for obedience to God and loving one another. Sin, indeed, is so thoroughly uncharacteristic of the Christian life that, it, that a life which is marked by sin cannot be called a Christian. And that's from, he, like I said before, uh, Pastor uses certain different people in his commentaries and stuff, and that's from a, a, um, a person named Bruce. We have, we have, it is a Greek present tense verb. We continue to have an advocate over and mm -hmm. over, okay? Someone who is called to be along your side and to assist you as a helper and counselor. God is known as, Jesus is known as our helper and counselor. Amen. Believers now have someone who defends them before God instead of accusing them. When we sin, we are not only to confess our sins, but we go to Jesus as our defense or advocate before the Father. Sin is so serious that we can only go into the Father's presence with our heavenly righteous lawyer. I love that. I thought that was so cool. And so uh, now, go ahead, hon. I'm going to read from chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. And it says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love, love for the Father is not in them. So if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desire passes away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever see jesus is our advocate and the atoning sacrifice to our sins and those of the whole world mm -hmm. the test that we really know him is obedience i know a lot of times a lot of people don't like that word oh my gosh obey obey yep. obey yep. but it's very important you want to live the christian life then you have to obey the expectations mm -hmm. of being a Christian and you guys know what it is you have a moral responsibility to do the right thing it says the New and the Old Testament there's a command the command is to love one another if you don't love your brother you're walking in darkness which is hate if you love your brother you walk in the light which is love you will not stumble or fall see there are two families there are the children of God, born of God, who practice righteousness by loving the brothers. There are children of the devil, born of him, who practice sin by not loving the brothers. Okay? We're Christians. We are loved by God. We're to, he purifies us. Okay? Our sin is, sin is lawlessness. It is literally, it's by sin, when you're constantly sinning, you're basically causing chaos in your life. Especially if you're saying that you're a Christian and that you're saying that you follow God and then you're secretly doing things over and over again that you know are wrong. And it's uh, when I'm talking, I'm talking over and over and over again. Um, 
we're supposed to abide in him. We're supposed to practice righteousness yes. and not sin. And again, our flesh is weak, and yes, we do sin, but like David, there, there's, there was four different things. Come to him with a humble heart. Really express the sorrow of sinning. And be, be honest about it, and, and do, do what you can through, obviously, through, definitely through God's help, to not mm-hmm. sin anymore. Especially if you're, if you're having a hard time with a same sin. If you're having a, a problem with a, a, the same sin in your life over and over again, you really need to realize that you need to seek out other avenues, whether it is through Pastor Charlie, whether it is through us, whether it is through, you know, like I've said before, you have grandparents, you have you have yes. people, you get, there's counselors, yes. and I know when you, a lot of people, when they say counselors, you know, we, we've we actually gone to a counselor sure. a long time ago. We're not ashamed of it. It was a Christian counselor, and she helped us on not only in a, in a marriage sense, but on a biblical, biblical. part Absolutely. of marriage. And so, and Pastor Charlie helped us with that. Quite yeah, a bit also. you have to realize that you have avenues to so you to sit here and say, "Well, I don't know how to stop this. I don't know how to do this. I keep doing the same thing over and over again. I can't stop it. I can't fix it." You know, those are lies mm-hmm. of the enemy. It, it, that's not how this works. So now we're going to go into chapter three. So it says here, John heard Jesus use the words "born again." You know, "born again." Like I said last week, uh, I saw a shirt that says, I'm, I'm born again. I didn't get it right the first time. I thought that was like so <laughs> entire, so so cute. So uh, let's go to chapter 3, three verse two. 2. And it says, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it is not yet what has been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. And we shall see him as he is. So it says, beloved. I love that word. I just love that word. Um, 10th Avenue North has a song called Beloved. And so does Jordan Fleece have a song. And it, Beloved. It's just, it's so, you know, I'm beloved by God. I'm his. So it says, now that we are children of God. So in order to be, now that you are children of God, means you have to be born again. And it says here, you have to be born of God. God is your father. If God is your father, then you are a child of God or a son or a daughter of God. You are part of God's immediate family. We are now called children of God. So being a part of this heavenly family involves a moral responsibility or obligation, living righteously and not sinning. Coming coming to this church is when I really understood because everybody called me brother. And, and called her sister, and I'm like, wait, what? What? Why? Why? That's why we are all in one family with one father. So, um, I think it's uh, verses 15 to 17, chapter 2. I already read that. Did you read that already? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, I want you to understand how crucial it is to, if you're sitting here saying that you're born again, and that you're now... In a part of God's family, we have to act accordingly, yes. like we are in part of God's family. I love your brothers. Mm-hmm. So now, uh, in chapter three is what we were talking about, the beloved. And I just lost my notes. Sorry. Please do. Where I, where I read that. I want to read this little thing down here. It says, "Place." What's so great about this Bible? Mm-hmm. It has these little so notes much and, in this. Oh, placed into God's family. In a general sense, all men and women are the offspring of God, in that he Mm -hmm. is the creator. This relationship, however, is not sufficient to offset the penalty of sin, because all persons are sinners separated from God. Therefore, for a sinful person to become a child of God, a miraculous transformation must take place. This Bible refers to this change as being born again. When an individual places his faith in Christ as Savior, he is born again into a new spiritual family, and he has a, a new a family relationship with God. You know, like God's my dad now. He gains God as father and other yes. Christians as brothers and sisters. Yes. Okay? Not only are Christians the, the, ch- the children of God by spiritual birth, they are adopted as well. This figure implies a dramatic transformation of status from slave to son, 
One is no longer in bondage to the master, but becomes a free son possessing all the rights and privileges of the sonship. One of these benefits is the right to call God Abba, Father, an affectionate term meaning Father. This marvelous relationship carries responsibilities with it as well as privileges. Everyone who has the hope of having his sonship perfected someday is presently purified in his own life. Since he bears the family relationship to God, he must also exhibit the family character. It's very important that we act accordingly. So we're going to go into, this is the first part of chapter 3. The second part of chapter 3 is basically talking about, it's kind of like love and hate. Yep. So go ahead. So I'm going to read verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 11 to 18. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. And it says, we should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his own brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has, and that doesn't mean, okay, to the word, you, you know, lay down your life like Jesus, okay, this is what it means. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. That's the deeds that we talked about last week. Mm -hmm. The deeds are very important. So basically, this is the overview of 1 John chapter 3. It talks a lot. Notice the words brothers or brother. Cain murdered his brother. His brother's works were righteous. Do not marvel my brothers. See, there's two kinds of love. There's a love of Cain versus the love of Jesus Christ. Cain laid down his own brother's life, where Jesus laid down his, his own, own life. life. For us, hatred characterizes the world, whose prototype is Cain. It originates in the devil, issues in murder, and is evidence of spiritual death. Love characterizes the church, whose prototype is Christ. It originates in God, issues in self-sacrifice, and is evidence of eternal life. If you want a sermon on who is in the devil's family or who's in God's family, just look at how they live and how they love. That's why John says, we know, we know, we know. The proof, the evidence, the ultimate test mm -hmm. that you are born again into the family of God is whether you agape love the brothers and sisters in this family. The family likeness is bound to appear. The love of the Father will be reproduced in his children. See, we're, we're, we're supposed to go out and, and show love and do the deeds and all this being that we have. It's not just faith. It's faith and deeds. You can't just get to heaven mm -hmm. by doing deeds, and you can't just get to heaven by just having faith. Okay, I got faith. That's good enough. No, the two have to go together. Yeah. We cannot love them. If we cannot love them, we cannot love the people of the world nor your enemies that hate you. It says, Pastor's note that, says that, that, here. That's good. Mm -hmm. Love your enemies that hate you. That's Everybody's heard that. you got to love your enemy. Love your enemy. Love Pray for your enemy. Well, that just mm -hmm. said it right there. It's kind of an important thing. And I've said this before, and I had to learn this the hard way, and I'm, I'll be fully ready to admit it. When you're praying for your enemy, you have to pray for their salvation for them and not to make your life easier yeah. and not about you. It has to be for for their, you know, Lord, they, they really don't know love. They, they've been hurt. Obviously, when someone's acting out of hate and stuff, they, they, they've been hurt somehow, some mm -hmm. way. And they don't know it. They don't know Jesus. They don't know any better. So we need to pray for their salvation. We need to pray for them. Because somehow along the road, along the road that they got broken really, really bad. It says here, 
Why bring up Cain when you're talking about love? Why? Because Cain and Abel were brothers. Why? Because if you don't love, you abide in death. Well, why? Because if you don't love, you're a murderer. Note that Cain didn't kill his neighbor, his business partner, his ex-wife, or any or a colleague. He killed his own brother. So, I want to pose this to you. I know that there are times I we have a lot of siblings in uh -huh. this room. Maybe you'd like to kill your own sibling. <laughs> you get so mad at them, you just, you know. But the whole thing is, that's something you need to look at. I know sometimes you guys are so great to other people and you help other people, but take a look in your own family. Are you helping your siblings? Are you happy when they're when they get when they get an award or when they've they've strived for something and they get it? Are you happy for them or are you jealous? Are you really happy and helping and working together? Or are you working apart and causing more strife in your own family and in your own home? You know, talks here a lot about agape love and love and hate and how we're supposed to walk in love are you doing that with your own sibling Cain sure didn't I hope you guys definitely do that better and another thing that I wanted to bring up is I showed that song Toby Mac's song about 21 sure, years because you know video, he, yeah. he lost mm -hmm. that he lost his son and I was watching a review of the, of, of other people reviewing the song and giving their their comments on it and one of the things uh, a Christian wrote in which I thought was really really good because it, it goes along the line of helping your brother so many people and we don't mean to do this we, we mean well but it really when he said this it kind of struck a chord with me he said so many people they mean well they say look you know what if you need anything just call me and I'll help mm -hmm. and then I and I mean you know, I mean that when I say that and when I was telling you last week about our neighbors, Luana and Lloyd, how he just came down with stage three cancer, I said that. If you need anything, you need me to bring you a Starbucks, you need to do anything, you just let you me just know. Just need to talk. Yeah. And I'm thinking the whole entire time, I'm showing I'm showing God's love. I'm doing good. And and I and don't get me wrong, I'm trying and in my head I am, but what this guy brought up is when we're in dealing with a tragedy or dealing with a very hard trial it's really hard to reach out to others and say hey do you mind it's just our nature I guess unfortunately and the reason why I know that is because when he was going through his surgeries I did not reach out to anybody now if someone called me and said hey Roberta I'm in your neighborhood can I bring you something yeah sure could you please bring me a salad Hey, uh, Roberta, I got a Starbucks for you. See, they already did it. They weren't waiting on me to say something or to do something. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that the guy brought up was instead of saying, you know what, if you need anything, I'll help you. Just give me a call. Because a lot of times the people they are, they, they're just, they just don't. Instead, he said, hey, you know what, I just made a spaghetti dinner. Um, what, you know, when would you like me to bring it over? Or do you want me to... You, I'll just bring it over. You can freeze it if you want, but it's there for you. Yeah. If yeah. that's something completely different, it takes the deed a little bit further. It makes it a little bit more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, just makes it more available. There you, go. Uh, you know, it, it makes it more, it brings it more to life, I guess is what I'm looking at. So, that's something that I wanted to bring up because that really struck a chord with me. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know what? I didn't call on anybody. If someone called me, I took them up on it. But I didn't seek anyone out. Mm -hmm. And it, sometimes because I think the reason is, is we're so missed into the trial. We're so involved in it that we really can't see. It's hard to see. Uh, and we don't want to bother anybody else. You know, like, well, what are, you know, or what if they say no? We tend to think that way. You know, like, I, I'm... This takes that totally out of the equation. Hey, mm -hmm. I just made a spaghetti dinner. Be over in a half an hour. You know, something Can't say like no that. to that. <laughs> you know, well, I'm just dropping it off, you know, because uh, something along that line. So, all right, so in chat, let's go now to chapter four. Chapter four is the heading that pastor has. It says, how to distinguish the spirit of God from the spirit of the Antichrist. They both exist. Mm hmm we have to realize where there's one, there's the other. We have to, I know some, so I've had people say, yeah, I believe in heaven, but I don't believe in hell. And just like, how is that even possible? Yeah. There's one, there's the other. So behind every prophet is a spirit. 
and behind each spirit is either God or the devil. Before we can trust any spirit, we must test them. It is their origin that matters. We're going to explain that in, a in just a minute. Okay, the verb believe, try, trust are Greek present tense and imperative verbs. Imperative. Okay, meaning it's a command. Yeah. All right, something I want to explain to you is you have to understand there are false prophets out there. There are people Oof. who make it sound like they're doing good for mankind or anything like that, but in actuality, it's the complete opposite. And one of the things that Pastor had in his notes, which is crazy, but I'm going to read it to you, and and he has followers. Okay, so it says, Dr. Leroy Thompson is known as the money-loving preacher. He's known as that. Holds money cometh to me and cashing in on Jesus conferences. Idolatry. Every sermon is about how to get rich mm -hmm. and get more money. He owns a 20,000 square foot home and several air, airplanes. And he his, I guess, some type of comment is, that at least 8500 you guys can at least give $1,000. Bring this up because you think, wow, that's so blatant, right? Mm -hmm. That's uh, how, how can anybody follow? How? He has and followers. Well, yeah. He's got like followers. 8,500 people watching. You guys can each say that. Yeah. There is literally people that are like that. They follow their, their followers of something that, oh, yeah, and if, if you just... You know, send me a hundred dollars. Your I've seen commercials for this holy water. You yeah. know, a hundred dollar holy water came from the Vatican. Blah blah blah. And you can you can buy it now, and it'll heal all your what? But pay attention. There are false prophets, false prophets out there, yes. and there there are people who have this this way of oh look, I'm doing good when in reality they're not. And the sad thing is. But it's truth is that sometimes even in situations, okay, like for instance. Even in the crisis situation. Yeah, this coronavirus, all right? Yeah. There's many, I, I, I listen to K-Love and it talks a lot about people encouraging other people. And we told you about that story in Smart and Final where that lady needed four gallons of milk and she could only get two. And some stranger bought the other two and just brought them over and gave them to her. So there are people like that. Those are people that we live we're we're living in a different moral compass mm -hmm. uh definitely whatever i'm doing i always give glory and honor to god it's never me it's always him i always shed the light to him i'm just the tool that's all i am but there uh chuck has a story yeah, about I saw live, live pd, PD. okay the, the cop show somebody called the police department and it was this guy was sitting in the parking lot of and this was back east somewhere, so it wasn't called Walmart. It was another local big department store like, like Walmart, okay? In the back trunk, he had it popped open, and he had a sign that says $60 for a, a container of toilet paper. $60. He went right into that store. He bought this, we'll say a case of toilet paper, okay? He probably paid $12 for it. He took him outside in the parking lot, and now he wants $60 for this case of toilet paper that he just paid $12 for. Same thing at a convenience store. Now, I personally saw this. There's the little tiny bottle of hand sanitizer. Advertise, price probably a buck or less. This this store is trying to sell it for $5.99, and, and the box is full. I said, hey, how many of these you sold? He goes, none. I said, well, I wonder why. $6 for a dollar bottle? Come on. That's being ridiculous. Not only that, in in Live PD, they went to go give him a ticket, and they went to tell him to stop. Yes, they and did. And his, his whole, he got so upset, and his whole thing was, I'm doing this to help out. I'm just I'm helping, doing this trying to help me. people. Yeah, I'm trying to help people. And he, like, and he's all upset and mad because he, he thinks that somehow or another he's thinking that he's doing that. And, and the I, store the store banned him from ever coming into their store or on their property it, again. That's how serious they took it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, this guy was being absolutely ridiculous. But like in when Katrina hit and all these different places, a lot of times people pop up saying that they're the Red Cross or something along yes. that line. That is definitely Antichrist. That is definitely not Horrible. displaying the love Gosh. of God whatsoever. You're not helping your You're not loving your man. brother. Yeah. Hey, you're not showing brotherly love there. So that's one of the things that we need to be pay real good attention to. Sometimes False it's prophets. blatant. It's yes. so easy to pick out and all that. Sometimes it's sly. 
And you really have to pay attention. The Holy Spirit is, is going to help you discern that. That's mm -hmm. that voice that you need to listen to that says, don't do that. Uh, that's not a if good idea. If you don't idea. listen, it just gets louder. Trust well, me. If you're listening, if you're truly listening, it gets louder. Yes. So another thing that chapter 4 talks about is it talks about the incarnation. Now I'm going to read that to you. The incarnation is that God took on human flesh and lived among us in a human body in the person of Jesus Christ. Yes. It's the most critical doctrine test of our uh, orthodox. Jesus Christ, as having come in the flesh, is not merely the center of the gospel, but the whole of it. Okay, for John, Christian belief could be summed up in one great sentence. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, that's in John 1, 14. Any spirit which denied the reality of the incarnation was not of God. See, we insist that true Christian faith requires knowing that Jesus Christ came in human flesh, lived in a human life, and died in the flesh. The incarnation is denied by a lot of false religions and cult groups, including yes. Mormonism. Yes, yes. The, to they deny, do not believe that yeah, he re was resurrected. They don't believe any of that. Nope. To deny the incarnation is a lie that comes from the spirit of the Antichrist. Yes. No system can be tolerated, however loud its claim, or learned its inherent, inherence, which denies that Jesus, the, Jesus is the Christ come in the flesh. In other words, either his eternal deity or his historic humanity. Those who deny the Son have never have oh, excuse me those who deny the son have neither the father nor the spirit not to con not to confess jesus is a decisive characteristic of false teachers um chuck and i we watch all those you know um murder mysteries and you know uh, the id go channel and i was watching something on um Basically, he was talking about how he had gotten sucked into a cult. He's a Christian now, but how he got sucked into a cult. And they called God Yahweh. And Yahweh is one of the words used. Sure. However, this whole thing was, is his dad, he was uh, telling a story about basically how his dad said that he was the Messiah uh, in the flesh now. That Yahweh has made him the the father and all this it, it, just craziness and there was this thing about uh, like put your arm up it's like if you're if you put your arm up you ask Yahweh a question if your arm falls down then it's not from Yahweh if your arm stays up then it's from Yahweh and the whole entire time all the members were holding the arm so they could make it go down or whatever and the person was supposed to stand there no it was like the person was supposed to stand there with their eyes closed crazy right but guess what? They had followers. They had people who believed. And then usually it's always something that uh, they were committing murders. And they were, he was committing, you know, he was telling people to go kill this person because that person was jealous of them or something crazy. And people did it. That, that's what we're talking about. It, it, as sane as the, insane and crazy as that is, that happens. It's, it's the Antichrist. We have to pay attention to that. So the one thing that I, I, I want to read is I want everybody to go to verses 11 and 12. Okay, so this is chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. It says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Again, that brotherly love. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another... God lives in us, and his law, love is made complete in us. No one has ever seen God. No one's ever seen the wind. You know it's there. You feel it. You see the trees move. No one has ever seen God. But we know he's there, and he is in us. See, it says, from who God is to what God has done to what we ought to do. God's love is his gift to us. Amen. But at the same time, it is an obligation laid upon us. The word also lays upon us the responsibility for manifesting similar characteristics. We are to love with a God-like love. 
ought and to love are Greek present tense of an ongoing action. See, the love we show to one another ought to be like the love which God has shown to us. I mean by that it should be sincere and pure without ulterior motives or other hidden thoughts. See, the confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is so powerful that it actually causes God to abide in you. Agape love for God and for others. It keeps us in God and God in us. We need to know and believe this love. You have to believe in agape love. You can always test where you are in agape love by looking at your view of judgment day. Are you full of confidence or are you full of fear? Perfect love casts out fear of judgment. The only reason we love God is because he loved us. If you cannot love a brother whom you can see, you cannot love a God who you can't, can't see. see. And that's very, that's very so powerful. True. I've told you guys about my cookie expeditions and how this is just blown up and taken off. Um, started, uh, shh. Okay. There's a 12-step program for this. Which, she just admitted step one. I'm not, okay. she's, I'm not taking she's admitting this. Step. <laughs> but anyway, um, I always have cookie dough on hand because it, it's, I don't, it's just a, a way to bless others by, and it shows God's love by doing something that is, you know, it, it takes a while. You know these little stencils that she uses for their airbrush? Okay, they're, they're about as thin as this. She's got two notebooks that thick filled with them. Okay, one is holiday and one is regular. So obviously I have to have two. So I don't even know what he's complaining about. Anyway, so um, one of the things I did is I'm always trying to bless somebody with these. And a lot of times they have, I actually have stencils that have Christian verses, um, mm -hmm. has all kinds of different things. I have uh, stencils that have like the cross, and, all, and and now that I have a cricket, I'm making my own stencils, and I'm doing my own thing, and it's really, really awesome. But I just sent uh, a whole box to K-Love. And so many times where... The, the radio station, yeah, K-Love. Yeah, yeah, I did. Their main uh, office. Okay. Where Skip and... And, and Amy, Amy and, and, and all, all of them All there. the DJs you hear. And they so, all have their own... Yeah, yeah, I did their... But it's... Their own cookies. It's sometimes, like, we're, we're... Even though... We're focused on on something. It's always nice to like they're they're an encouraging radio station. Yes. Everybody knows that, and they're always there. We I've heard them so many times. They pray. People call in and they're crying or they're upset, and, and they pray over them. And they have so much to offer. I just thought it was nice to to in turn show God's love back to them. So yes, they're a Christian station, but we also have to do that with other people who are not Christians. And it is an agape love that you just, you do whatever the will of God is, whether it's in a cookie or, you know, doing yard work for your elderly neighbor or whatever. It's very important that we have that mindset of doing whatever God to display God's glory. That is Lenore. So yeah, I did I did mention Lenore one more time. <laughs> Lenore taught me that we we were made to display God's glory. That is what we're doing. And when we become born again, that is what our our life's goal is is to display God's glory and nothing else. Everything we do, everything we say, every action we have, anything we do is always to display God's glory. So think about for a second if you're doing something are you displaying God's glory or are you not? You know, and that should, uh, if you're not displaying God's glory, you need to really look into your son and, and, and have God help you to not do that. Yeah, and if you're doing something, say to yourself, huh, would Jesus approve of this? Uh -huh. Well, maybe I shouldn't do it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yep. So the last thing we're going to go into is chapter five. So again, I'm going to go back to pastor's notes. Uh, there's four subtitles in chapter five. The first title is Victory Over the World. And it says, notice the, the four and because at the beginning of verse four, we're going to read verse four. Chapter five. Five, verse four. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. 
our faith. So it says here, notice four and because at the beginning of verse four. That is why God's commands are not burdensome. Notice the words, has overcome. It's not a future victory, but one that is already secured. Mm -hmm. Notice that overcomes is, continues to overcome, and overcomes is keep on overcoming. Our faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son keeps us overcoming this evil world. And again, that's another Christian song, mm -hmm. Overcomer. Our faith rests four square on the fact that Jesus Christ has defeated death, and anybody that can defeat death can defeat anything. The next thing they talk about is the assurance of salvation. It says, we have overcome the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. We've overcome the evil one who controls this whole world. The next one is guidance in prayer. You know, it's a very short, little short area, but it talks about guidance and prayer. If you need guidance in prayer, it, it helps you right in, in chapter uh, verses 14 to 17. There's mm -hmm. a little blip in there about guide, how to help you guidance in prayer. And then the last one is freedom from habitual sin. If you're having a habitual sin problem, look it up. Look, it, look in there and read it. See, basically what chapter 5 is... John exhorts Christians to live by faith because through our faith in Christ, we overcome the wickedness of the world. In addition, John writes one of the most powerful and assuring statements concerning the work of Jesus on the cross. This is uh, 5 verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. If you believe in the Son of God, then you have eternal, eternal life. life. And it says here, John wanted all believers to know 100% that because of our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that we would sp spend all of eternity with him. One more thing we wanted to do really quick. So that is 1 John. See, a lot of meat in that. Mm -hmm. Now there's also 2 John and 3 John. Which we'll They're really next short, week. but we're going to do that next week with Jude. Um, we might be in church real soon. Yes. Don't know yet. We're Hopefully, keep praying for it. Keep praying for it. And uh, Bert has got something special. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go and zoom in on some of All these. Right. So one of the things that I wanted to, to show you guys real quick is... You know, we had written all those encouraging notes and everything like that that I had you guys do when this quarantine thing first started. And one of the first notes that we got was a thank you from a lady named uh, Sherry Haley, and this is from Solstice. So she just wrote a little thank you. I just wanted to give all thanks for the candy that you brought to Solstice. You really brightened our Easter so much. God bless you. One other thing that we got, we actually got this from Petey and David Cavazos. When um, some of you did the fire station, some of you did the elders of the church, some of you did Solstice, some of you did Marjorie Mason Center. And this is from David and, and Petey. And it says, dear, dear youth and leaders, thank you for your card of encouragement and well wishes in these times of trials and tribulations. Your prayers are much needed as we wait on the Lord for wisdom and direction. We truly believe on his word in Jeremiah 29, 11, that only his, he knows the plans for, that he has for all of us. But we know these plans are for good, for a hope, and for a future. Please hold on to that and trust in him. David and I are so proud of you and your leaders and all the good works that you are doing. Do you see how important it is to do good works? It's so important. It, it brightens up people's day. It makes them, this is showing God's love right here. Doing things like this, that's why I, I really believe in this. She said that um, our scripture to all of you is in Hebrews 13, 21, 20 to 21. Make our God of peace make you complete in every work to do his will. Or to do his will not our own we love you and continually pray for you now i want you guys to look that up hebrew 13 20 21 and read it the last thing i wanted to show you really quick i got these in i know you guys see so many of these but these are very important because look that's a whole classroom when we did martin luther king school 
Look at all those signatures. See? Here they are there. Look at all these notes. All the coloring. Look at how pretty that is. All these notes that says thank you. I, you know, I felt I felt surprised. I could I will use my tools to help me. Thank you for the present. Thank you for this gift. I felt happy. I will use these tools to do my homework. Thank you for this gift. I felt very happy. I will use my tools to help me. It's a, I felt so excited. Oh, look at this one. Look at those hearts. You see? Thank you for this gift so much. I was so surprised. All these kids. Boy, they are sure colorful, aren't they? Look at all that. These are notes to us. And we don't do it, like Pastor was saying, when we do something, we don't do it to get a pat on the back or to get like, you know, oh, look at me, look at me. We do it because God calls us to do it, and we're trying to display God's glory in everything that we do. But it is nice to get encouragement, and that's one of the reasons why I sent the cookies to Caleb. Really cool. It's still nice to get encouragement back because it knows it it shows us that we're doing we're do, we are doing the work of God, and we're going to continue to do so. Amen. So thanks, guys, for tuning in again next week. We'll go to Second and Third John. We well, don't we know hope, where this is going to go, we but hope maybe we'll see you next week. I we'll don't know. We'll see how this goes. But we love you and we miss you very very much. If you noticed, I am a little bit taller. I got new shoes, but I can't. The girls aren't here to show. I don't have. I can't show you. It's I don't think a I can pair live. of shoes. It's, a, it's shoes, but they love them. But anyway, so I miss you guys. <laughs> I know, like I can't show you my new shoes or you know new stuff. It's so I I, I miss having you here. Yes. So, um, uh, Jimmy and Alexis, we hope you enjoyed the cookies. I know I feel like I'm talking about cookies all the time. Tune in next week. We'll see how this goes. Love you. Miss you. Love you guys. Have a good day. Bye.